Knocks it through. Mullen bursting into the box. Josh Mullen. Mullen's ball across. It's turned in. It's Pittman who's got it. Livingston leads. Now can they get the ball back in? O'Brien. The lead. And Livingston have the lead. Man, the score. The full time whistle blows and David Hay celebrates. And the Livingston fans join in exultation. Livingston had the lead against Rangers. And they are certainly rising to a few occasions on their return to the top flight in Scotland. Hello and welcome back to Talk Livy, the podcast dedicated to everything Livingston Football Club and Scottish football, proudly sponsored by Stiarna Apparel. My name is Angus and today I'm joined by Ewan. Ewan, how are you doing? I'm all right. I'm not that <laughs> enthused by the by the football on Saturday that was on show. We'll obviously come on to talk about that. I think we need to say congratulations to Callie Thistle. They thoroughly deserve to win the tie. The guys that from the Winer Shuffle who came on last week, I'm sure they would have enjoyed the their away day in the end. But yeah, that was pretty disappointing. And of course, I I wasn't there to see the the women's team run riot at the weekend, so I got no good football fix really <laughs> from Livingston FC. <laughs> Granted, was very happy with the result. But how are you doing, mate? You, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a bit surprised we're recording. This is Monday because you were watching the Super Bowl last night. Yeah. You know, barring bar that event that apparently happened on Saturday afternoon, you know, I'm not choosing not to think about it too much. I'll see how well that goes in the next couple of minutes. Very, very good weekend. And yeah, culminating last night with the Super Bowl, got home about 5 a.m. Somehow woke up, you know, a reasonable time and I'm giving you a message that, you know, we're all good to, to get this recorded. So, uh, you know, thankfully, you know, not in a, a bad state or anything like that. The team that I was supporting did lose, though. This is something I would like to say to you, Ewan. They build up, so the game finished, what, with three points of difference, and it finished by just a kick down the middle. The way that they were building this kick up, if you go up a park, anybody in the raw dad would be able to do it. But there's some guy practicing like air motion kicks, getting paid millions of dollars and all that, and they're trying to make it out as if it's like a hard thing to do. Fucking piss easy, in all honesty, but. Yeah, you, um, you say that. Have you ever watched the, the League of Their Own road trip and they go to take field goal kicks and they're absolutely <laughs> atrocious at it? So I, th- I think it's shape of that ball is a little bit more complex than it maybe looks, but they're going to get paid an awful lot of money, so I'd expect them to be pretty good at it. Exactly, but yeah, at least we do have some good Livingston content to talk about with the women's team, but you know we will get onto that very soon. Um, but as always, you can find this episode as well as all of our others on your preferred podcast streaming sites. Just search for Talk Livy or follow us and subscribe to ensure you don't miss another episode. We'll kick things off by discussing our Scottish Cup fifth round exit as the Lions were stung badly by Callie Thistle and exited the competition. Our women's side faced a top-of-the-table clash with Renfrew, but in fact they secured another big three points in their promotion push. And finally, I caught up with Alex from This Is Ibrox to look ahead to our game with Rangers at the weekend. Uh, so, yeah, you and the Lions end up on the end of a cup shock again. You know, how long it's been since, you know, we've had any joy in the Scottish Cup. 3 0 loss to Championship side Inverness. Is is there just something with us in the Scottish Cup that, you know, we're just cursed by? Yeah, we clearly are. You know, to summarise, Richard Goff was the last manager that took us into the last eight of the Scottish Cup well back in 2005. <sighs> the game. We talked about this when we were talking about our memories of the Scottish Cup and I'd said there was so many ties that almost merged into one with us over 
the years in kind of the fourth and fifth round in particular. And this one just fits into that bracket pretty seamlessly, I think. It was just a bit of a nightmare showing from start to finish. And I think what makes it all that little bit worse is you look at the last eight and you've got a really good chance of possibly progressing further to hand. And obviously Wraith Rovers knocking Motherwell out as well. You could get Falkirk or Darville in the draw for the next round. Air United, granted, are doing well in the championship. Kilmarnock as well, a team that we've we've certainly had their number this season. So there was a lot of potentially really good ties available there to get to the to the semi-finals and a trip to Hamden. And I think that's what's probably made the result all the more deflating, never mind the performance itself. But looking at the, the game, there was a couple of changes to the side. Morgan Boys came out. I think reading what Callum Carson said, that was due to illness. So Ayo Obelai came in and Jason Holt came in for Sean Kelly. So there was a couple of changes to the side, but it's not changes that you look at and go, oh, he's, he's really weakened the team. He's, he's maybe underestimated Inverness and certainly listening to Davey in the build-up to the game. He definitely wasn't underestimating them. They've already came in, came to our place and beat us this season in the League Cup. So they've had our number, and that's them now six games unbeaten against us across you know the last few seasons. Three of those games have been when we've been the, the top flight club as well. So I don't think it was a case that Davy was underestimating them, but you know, early doors, Bruce Anderson having to come off. I think it was after, you know, just over 10 minutes probably changes the game plan a little bit. From what I watched, it looked like we were almost trying to draw Inverness out and play quickly over the top. And losing Bruce probably affects that quite quite a bit. You don't have Bruce running in behind, using his pace. And I don't think the changes helped putting Penrice into the front three. It just seemed a little bit disjointed, in my opinion. Granted, I think we still had a couple of reasonable opportunities albeit nothing really getting created from open play. Iobali had a chance that failed to him at the back post. He's He's got to hit the target. Stephen Bradley had a free kick. Ridgers has made a decent save from. Then Fitzwater's had one he should maybe get on the end off and, and make a little bit more of it. But Inverness, I think, had our number in terms of tactically. I don't think they were creating a great deal of opportunities in the first half. They weren't carving as open themselves. They did look a, a threat on the counter-attack, much like the League Cup tie early in the season. But I think tactically they nullified us. And a lot of credit has to be given to Billy Dodds and Inverness for, for doing that. And then second half. <sighs> what can I say about the goals in the second half? They're atrocious. They're atrocious goals they concede. The, the first one is just a long ball down the middle. The space in between the centre halves, Obelai and Fitzwater, you could fit a tanker in between them. It was it was that big a gap. Great finish by Billy McKay. Don't get me wrong, fantastic finish, taking nothing away from that. Again, we had probably another couple of opportunities after that. Guthrie's had a header well wide again from a set play. Nothing from open play. The second goal, you can question it being an offside in the build-up. We can obviously come on to talk about the, the situation with VAR that we made the decision not to use that for the game but regardless of that offside the, it can still be dealt with so much better the cross coming into the box no pressure put on the ball for the cross Welsh has just wandered into the box nobody has picked him up he's got a free header in the middle of your 18 yard box that shouldn't be happening and again granted it's a very good header great finish by by Sean Welsh Again, give credit where it's due. But we just, we looked lacklustre. We looked nervy all afternoon, I thought. And and then it's kind of summarised with the last goal. Jack Fitzwater's been caught on the ball. Billy McKay's got onto the edge of the box. The attempt to put a block in from Iobali on the edge of the box was, was pretty much non-existent, to be totally honest. And again, Credit where it's due, it's a fantastic finish by Billy McKay, but yeah, it was it was a very, very bad afternoon. I, I don't want to go into lay into the team so much because you know, we sat on this podcast last week, Angus, saying how good a place we were in. You know, it was a fantastic performance against Kilmarnock. It, for me, it is just one of these days where 
everything that could go wrong has pretty much gone wrong. It just so happens it's all the more disappointing it's came against the lower league opposition in the Scottish Cup where you've got a good opportunity to progress and I don't want to dwell on it too much because I think overall we've had a very successful season so far but you know looking online at, at fans reactions I think yeah a few fans haven't taken it very well to, to put it bluntly but it was an all round poor performance and Davies came out and apologised for it he knows that's not good enough the players will know that that's not good enough and Hopefully they can get the reaction when it comes to playing Rangers in their next league game. I think the strangest thing, the strangest aspect of it is going from that performance last week to this. What has happened? We went from hundred to zero. Like it's incredible. It, it reminds me of the preseason game against Morton. Yeah, and how we absolutely capitulated there and. I don't know if this is something that may, possibly we should be con- concerned about because every time we seem to play a championship side in recent years, the performances haven't been good enough. You know, you go back to, you know, where we came back from COVID season, you know, I think we had Rafe Rovers in the group. We were awful. You know, there's been plenty of times in the group stages of the Bre- uh, the Premier Sports Cup or whatever it is that we've been, you know, not at it. Tell me Inverness again this season, not good enough. Playing there as well. Is there an element of us, you know, underestimating these teams? I know, obviously, we're coming out and not saying it, but looking at the, looking at that performance, it was, I don't know if arrogance is the right way to say it, but it did look as if a lot of the players kind of thought, we're, we just need to kind of show up and we'll roll over this team, which, you know, if you're sitting fourth in the Premiership against a Championship side, you probably should be expected to do so, but... The biggest, the biggest thing for me in that performance that was, you know, hugely disappointing was we've always been known since we came up and, you know, in that championship season that for being a hard working side and, you know, working on scraps and everything like that, that was non-existent. And I think that is the most disappointing aspect of it. We could have huffed and puffed and tried and, you know, things didn't come off, you know, fair enough. And you get like three counter-attacking goals. But we can't even say that. It wasn't as if we were unlucky at all. It was... It was just poor, it was just flat, and yeah, the defensive efforts as well. Like, I, I can't even really just singly blame the defence, it's just everybody was off. There's genuinely not a single player who gets past marks, and at least, you know, the players have probably developed a lot of a lot of credit in the bank, especially this season, to, you know, to be like, you know what, fair enough, you know, happens now and again. Against championships teams, maybe that's not quite as acceptable, but you know what, maybe not going too far into them just yet because, you know, there has been so many instances this season where, you know, they have, you know, went above above and beyond the expectations and whatnot. But it still doesn't take away from that is the most shambolic performance of the season, to put it bluntly. But yeah, we've got to put that out of our system, you know, as quick as possible because, you know, I don't think anybody would like to be dwelling on it. You know, it's listening listening to you recap the game there, it's just you know, flashbacks of, you know, PTSD and stuff like that. It's just not a great feeling. But, yeah, there's there's just genuinely nothing to it that, you know, we usually go on and we usually say about, like, oh, was there anything that, you know, was kind of positive in the game? <laughs> there's absolutely nothing in this one. <laughs> yeah, as you say, it's difficult to, to try and pick any positives from the game. Actually, I do have one. <laughs> I have a positive. You and... Are you aware of the latest thing that the club shop is selling? No. Oh, is it this fluffy? Oh, mate, it is so good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? If anybody's listening and they're needing a little bit of, you know, something to pick them up from this weekend, the club shop are selling hoodies and they are so good, so soft, so comfy. And I think that as a collective, we should just remember this weekend as, you know, the first time that, you know, the club was properly getting these back in, uh, back in in stock, and that that is the way I'm going to. That's all I'm going to take away from this game. In all honesty, oh god, it's it's terrible that that's the one highlight for you <laughs> of the afternoon. Uh, as you say, it's looking at the game. It's very difficult to pick out the positives, and but when you when you try and balance it out, we're not the only team that's been on the end of a of an upset in the Scottish Cup this season. Aberdeen lost a West of Scotland side in the last round of the competition. Motherwell have just been knocked out by Wraith Rovers in the same round as ourselves. 
this can happen in cup football from time to time. You know, we spoke about when we've gone up to Pataudry when we were the lower league side and, and gone and knocked Aberdeen out. It can happen. I think it's the manner in which it's happened is what's probably upset fans the most. And I saw a couple of posts on on Twitter and Facebook having a go at the players. And I think somebody had mentioned Nicky Devlin had had a, a word back at a couple of fans who were giving him a bit of stick. Somebody had commented that David Martindale had done the same. I've seen David do it. I sit behind the dugout. I've seen David do it a few times. I think it's just in his nature. He, he's pretty up front and he'll have, a, he'll have a discussion with a fan. But yes, the performance was bad, but folk are having are going off their nut about the likes of Davy, the likes of Nicky having a having a little chip back at folk. If you're going to sit in the stand and give these guys dogs abuse for, for 90 minutes, don't be surprised if they maybe have a little chip back. And to me, I think it just shows that they care. So don't think, I don't look at the team. I, I don't think anyone can look at this Livingston team over the last five years when we've been in the top flight and a couple of seasons before that and say that the players don't care. I think it is... I'm putting it down to a bad day at the office and I'm sure the players will bounce back. They typically do. We have been very good at doing it over the seasons. Do I think it's probably our worst performance since Davies had the job? Yeah, I probably would say it is our worst performance since Davies been in. It was the most unlivy like performance. But as I say, I'm putting it down to it was just a bad day at the office and I'm I'm absolutely certain the players will be back in Today training. I wonder if they did anything on Sunday, in all honesty. <laughs> <laughs> they, they may well they may well have, but if they weren't, I'm sure they're back in today and they're chomping at the bit to to right the wrongs of Saturday and, and go again and try and push for that top six spot and potentially European football. Cause as I say, let's let's get in perspective a little bit. We are sitting fourth in the top flight with the lowest budget. Let's try and get some perspective. One cup defeat shouldn't overshadow what has so far been a very, very good season, in my opinion. You you have to echo that, you know. I think if this becomes a bit more, you know, you've referenced the Aberdeen and Motherwell kind of cup shocks this season. They're two teams are, you know, having, you know, two of their worst seasons in the last, you know, 20 odd years or whatever like that. This is very much a blip. The issue comes with if this becomes like a regular thing, it's not been. And, you know, hopefully it does not. That's when, you know, sure, we could maybe start becoming, like, kind of questionable. Like that, you know. But, yeah, just very, very poor. Very, very much off it. Nothing really good to take away from the game whatsoever. Just got to dust themselves off and, you know, maybe next season we just, you know, do a Man United in the late 90s and just patch the Scottish Cup. How about that? I did see a few suggestions about that online as well, just giving up the <laughs> Scottish Cup. For a couple it's of seasons, it, it? like <laughs> it's really not worth it. Like, but probably the the other really negative from the game was Bruce Anderson coming off injured early doors. Again, we sat on last week's podcast waxing lyrical that we had Bruce Nubly back in the same team. You've got to pray that Bruce's injury isn't serious, eh? Yeah, especially since Conchalves has went out and found his scoring boots all of a sudden as well. By the way, <laughs> that I don't think he'd even met his teammates prior to going into the dressing room. I'd seen him getting interviewed on Sports Scene, and he's then went and produced that. Oh Christ! But yeah, how how excited we were to you know to have Newbley, Anderson, and Bradley all playing together, and then you know that lasted that lasted long for us. But yeah, hopefully we can you know have. Bruce back in full fitness um, for the game against Rangers because yeah, he's a massive difference to the team and you know he missed a, a good chunk of the tail end of last season as well and um, due to an injury which stopped him from reaching a goal scoring record uh, in the top flight for us. Yeah, we just got to hope that you know he'll be back in and you know back scoring again. The other kind of talking point was before the game, I guess, but it was the club's decision not to take up the option to use VAR for the cup tie. What was your kind of take on that? Because for me, I think Davy explained himself pretty well with regards yeah. to why the club weren't taking up the option. Yeah, I don't, honestly, I don't really care. <laughs> I've had enough of VAR and you know, not to have it, that alone is a good enough reason for me. Just there's no reason. 
like it didn't happen, cool, great. But yeah, to say it's like a cost efficient thing way. I think the fact, you know, they're seeing a lot of people online being like, Oh, like how can they just decide? It's based off of both teams, how many cup ties have already this season not had it. They keep on saying either all of them should or none of them should. Yeah, cool. None of them have it then. You look at all the other games in you know in the league in the division in the Scottish Cup this season, would you think Air United and Elkin had it? Nah. Like if people go and just moan about everything. Um, you know, VARs this, VARs that, but then when it's you know, they just want it to be used and enforced into absolutely everything as well. But yeah, I just fed up of it. And if there's if the second goal does have an offside in the build up to it, then you know so be it. You know, I I think there's bigger flaws in our defensive actions rather than you know an offside goal being given there. But yeah, good thing you know we've got Rangers this weekend for VAR being back. That's great, isn't it? Well, VAR worked against Rangers. And their cup tie, to be fair, don't, don't think the penalty that was given against them was ever a handball in one of the Sundays, but to kind of touch on... The, you see the one the boy got, like, suplexed to the ground on the edge of the box as well. Uh, yeah. Granted, maybe that one, right? But... Got it well. <laughs> oh, don't want yeah. to get my tinfoil hat out, but... <laughs> but, yeah, to kind of touch on us not taking up VAR, I think if you, if you look at the simple... Arithmetic with regards to it, the crowd was what just over a thousand. If you take an average for the game, say ten pound a head in terms of somebody coming through the gate, then you take off the ten grand for implementing VAR for that game. Yes, yeah, it's, it's nonsensical to make use of it. But as you say, the amount of stick that we seem to have got for not using it when Kilmarnock, St Mirren. Dundee United in the last round, none of them opted to use it. Dundee United Kilmarnock in this round, an all premiership tie, opted not to use it. The only two clubs that used VAR were Celtic and Rangers. The two clubs that have said that there is an agenda against them with VAR. So, yeah, make of that what you will. But let's let's put this one behind us, Angus. I'm fed up talking about that game. We're at the cup again. It's the same old. We're delighted to have Strana Apparel as sponsors of Talk Livy. UK based with a Swedish soul, we are Strana. Strana is an independent fashion brand from Scotland who create high quality and stylish attire for on and off the terraces. Inspired by terrace culture, lifestyle and music, all their clothing is designed using quality materials and workmanship to combine the very best style and fit. And all of this means you get a premium quality fashion at affordable prices while enjoying a simple and secure service. As a bonus for Talk Livy listeners, you can get 10% off your order using the code TALKLIVY at the checkout. We'll also have some exclusive giveaways during the season, so keep your eyes peeled on our socials for those too. And thanks to Starner for sponsoring Thought Levy. After a series of away fixtures, our women's side were back on home plastic as they welcomed Renfrew for a top-of-the-table clash. It would prove to be an emphatic victory for the league leaders as they cruised a 10-1 victory. Angus, you were there to take this one in. Safe to say it was a pretty good day at the office for yourself. Honestly, Ewan, I'm absolutely stunned. It was as, as bad as the men's team were on the Saturday, the women's team were absolutely electric they were frighteningly good going into this game you know it was built up you know there was actually a, a bit more of a buzz on social media about it and stuff like that i think you know a couple of extra people came in and took it in because it was a you know expected to be a close top of the table clash and it was, it just, was anything but <laughs> it was yeah and it is as one-sided a performance and it's as commanding a performance i've ever seen um you know probably from any game it was honestly. There's, I'm struggling to think of the words to kind of like sum it up because, from start to finish, they were absolutely brilliant. The thing early on in the game, you know, just pressing straight away, you know, 
They didn't let Renfrew have any time on the ball. Every single loose ball, we were on to it. And the biggest thing for me, and I think that, you know, we've kind of talked about this quite a lot of the time, is, you know, working the ball, being patient with the ball and everything like that. We kept the ball so incredibly well. Every time like, the ball would drop to a centre back or that, it wasn't going just kind of like straight forward into a channel or that. The ball was being recycled. We were working them around, creating the options. Midfield, we're looking for We had Raywin Murphy sitting in, uh, you know, in the hole with, you know, Brogan Anderson and Shannon Mulligan. Shannon Mulligan, who I think had, you know, our best game of the season so far. Very much, you know, what Shannon, you know, we know that she can do. She was, you know, energetic on the pitch. You know, she was getting on the ball, making passes, getting stuck into challenges as well, which is absolutely, you know, brilliant to see. And Brogan Anderson, you and is just an incredible signing. You know, the quality on the ball is, you know, unreal. Playing out in the, playing to the flanks with a, uh, Lucy Brown and Sharon Hughes as well, you know, there was just such like a fluidity and a tempo that was just through the whole game. And, you know, massive credit to Jen and Ashley up top as well, because, you know, in, in these kind of games and stuff like that, it can be quite easy for, you know, strikers to become, you know, selfish and, you know, kind of just keep going for glory themselves. But, you know, they were never, ever kind of putting themselves before the team. You know, they kept on doing the right stuff. They kept on, you know, hassling and harrying and, you know, get closing down defenders and, you know, getting on the ball, laying each other off, you know, and the amount of goals, you know, I wish I could go through every single goal with you, but, like, it's, it's going to take, you know, <laughs> so, so long, but there's, like, chances, you know, they're having, but, you know, there's a better option, like, slightly to the side of them, you know, laying off, like, their strike partners and that, and there isn't, like, saying it, it was a complete performance is, you know, it's no stretch of that at all. It was absolutely phenomenal. Renfrew genuinely didn't have, you know, I don't think Charlotte was really brought into, you know, making like any saves at all. The goal that Renfrew gets is a, you know, a bit of, you know, maybe a bit of complacency. The one aspect of the game, you know, a goal kick kind of hits off the player and goes into the back of the net. But, you know, looking for ourselves, you know, you're looking at it and the amount of goals that we scored that were brilliantly team play, you know, either pressing, you know, high up the pitch, winning the ball in their final third and laying it off to us, or, you know, working it out wide and cutting it back for, you know, tremendous like finishes in that yeah um, and you know speaking to a couple of people who were in attendance of the game it was just massively enjoyable and you know we were all in agreement that it's head and shoulders the best that they've ever played and you know that's a team who are in third place that they've just steamrolled essentially and in all honesty it could have been much more than you know 10 like if they you know on another day you know I think the Renfrew keeper may actually you know had a fairly decent game you know made some decent saves um, you know, to only keep it down to, to 10. Absolutely blown away by the performance. I mean, I think usually I have like a think after most games, you and I say like, who would be the or like the player of the match? There's genuinely about six or seven candidates. And if you give it to any one of them, I mean, you look at Ashley, got, you know, a hat trick and, you know, a couple of assists. Jen, you know, two goals. I think I uh, played a part in a few goals as well. Shannon Mulligan, absolutely tremendous. Brogan Anderson, brilliant. Lucy Brown, just absolutely tremendous. And then, you know, even the back line, you know, I think Aaron Burns had, you know, by far our best game for the club. Just a lot of composure at the back. You know, the ball's coming into areas they're, they're dealing with the, the attackers, but, you know, keeping the ball and, you know, maintaining possession. And Renfrew just couldn't get near them at all. You know, Jess and uh, Tash as well. Just, you know, the fluidity for the whole team, it was just absolutely beautiful to see. And I'm sure you're absolutely raging that you weren't here to see it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit disappointed I wasn't there <laughs> to, to see it. It's one of those ones I actually probably get more frustrated when I'm not at games that they win. I'm like that with the men's team as well. I get more frustrated if I don't make a game and they win it because <laughs> I wasn't there to witness it. But yeah, from certainly I was keeping up to date and keeping tabs on it on Twitter and it sounded like they were playing some scintillating football and We've spoke about this most of the season, Angus. They've shown a really gritty side to them this season, which they maybe didn't last year. But we've always known there's a team in there that can play very good football on their day and they can be a bit more progressive in terms of working the ball from the back and they've got the players to do it. And it seems to have culminated there. Certainly, I listened to the little bit that Jen Dodds did with the, the media team and it sounds, obviously... Jen, Dodds, Ashley Elizabeth and Brogan Anderson getting into the same side. We spoke about that a few weeks ago and how that might help in terms of being a little bit more creative from the middle of the park and it certainly seems to have helped a little bit. Yeah, that front three is, you know, for for this league is, you know, 
head and shoulders better than you know anybody else like comfortably. Jen and Ashley, you know, to I think the, the most pleasing thing about their performance as well was you know doing that unselfish work, you know that hard work, you know even going you know four or five nil up, they still hassled and harried. You know they were hungry for those extra goals and. Yeah, I think we said this about Brogan Anderson the last game a couple of weeks, and that is just an absolutely tremendous addition. You know, the quality on the ball is, you know, a different level. And at this level, she's, you know, absolutely strolling games. And again, though, we talk about the hard work that's going on, and that kind of starts with her as well. You know, she could, she's obviously, you know, controlling and dictating the game alongside, you know, the likes of Shannon in the middle of the park. But, you know, maintaining it with that, that presence on the park, you know, not giving the opposition any time. The team were just fighting for each other the whole game and, you know, that allows these kind of more, you know, flair players, the ones who can make the difference in that final third to do so and, yeah, we've, I think we've spoke about it a good times that we know that how good the team can play and, you know, this was, you know, the best example of, you know, them playing genuine football and it was absolutely, absolutely beautiful to watch in all honesty. You're waxing lyrical about them and I think rightly so but that, that puts them 15 points clear at the top of the league now. I think they might have played a couple of games more than the likes of Rossville and Renfrew and behind them, but still a 15-point gap at this stage in the season is enormous and gives them a really good cushion. I think they've got a couple of home games coming up now as well, Green at Morton being the next one next weekend. They've got to try and take that momentum into the next game, don't they? Yeah, I think that is the, the very much important thing is... There's no point going and putting a good performance and winning ten one to then go and drop points next week against a team more in the league. The it's all about, you know, can maintaining those standards and, you know, making it a regular occurrence. You know, you can play in that and you look how easy it is and you look how enjoyable it was. You know, you've seen the scenes like like after each goal and that, you know, delighted for one another. You know, go and continue that into the next game. Go and make the statement. Go and make teams, you know, come in fear, come into play use and stuff like that. Big game against Morton next week as well. You know, you've just got to continue that momentum. And if they play again like they did, you know, on Saturday there, then you know it'll be another victory for them because I don't think any team will be able to match them if they play like that. But it is nothing as we've seen with the men's team this weekend. You and nothing is taken for granted. You can have a performance that's one of the best, um, and then the week after, you know, it can be a shadow of that. So it is just very, very important, you know, to keep their heads, you know on the ground that they, you know, keep on level at the moment. Hopefully the coaching staff and that in the training sessions we kind of re- reiterating that message that, you know, they just have to go again and, you know, keep on doing it until, you know, they get the silverware or whatever they're looking to, to get out of the season. Well, well, here's hoping, because I'm hoping to make it along next week. So <laughs> I, I hope they produce a similar performance, but uh, a little shout out to Blair. Let's get the highlights up as soon as possible. Yeah, I mean... I think as well, I don't know if the, the Twitter format allows for videos that long to be <laughs> to be posted on it. Just by the time you get 11 goals out of the footage, you know, it's going to be, you know, probably about a five minute video at that as well. Um, I'd also like to thank Callum for deciding, Callum Carson for deciding to take holiday this week, which means I've only got 250 words for the for the Courier Match Report. I think I'm going to get everybody's name in and I think that's going to be it. So apologies for that one. But, you know, I can't be stressed enough that, you know, this is by far the best that this team has ever played. The women's team have never, you know, brushed aside as good opposition as this in such convincing fashion. And, you know, massive credit to all of them. That is such an unbelievable performance. I'm delighted to welcome Alex Donaldson from This Is Ibrox onto the podcast. Alex, how are you doing, mate? Doing very well, mate. Thanks for having me here. No, thank you very much for coming on. Now, since we last played you guys at Ibrox, I think it was kind of November time, roughly, there's been a bit of change at Ibrox, hasn't there? Van right. Bronckhorst has been moved on, a familiar face, and Michael Beale's come back through the door in the hot seat. First of all, do you think it was the right decision to move Van Bronckhorst on, and how did you feel about the appointment of Michael Beal? I feel like based on league form solely, it was the right thing to do. I'm not sure 
you know, obviously I, I was a fan of Van Bronckhorst. I'm thankful for all he did, winning us the cup and getting us to the European final. But it probably had to happen for the sake of for the sake of a league. I think certain managers are bad fits for certain leagues. You know, depending on their style, I think he was a bit too uh, pragmatic, a bit too defensive. You can argue that he was hard done by with injuries, but either way, it it, it did happen. And now Michael Beale's in someone who has you know a four year minimum understanding of the league as assistant to Gerard. So I think, you know, at the very least, we've seen our league form get a lot better. So hopefully, well, not no offence to you, hopefully it continues this weekend. <laughs> the thing with Van Bronckhorst, as you kind of mentioned, having won the Scottish Cup last year, having taken mm. you to the European final, do you reckon there's maybe an argument that he was a bit hard done by, that he maybe wasn't given the full season? Maybe. I think it, it's it's hard to judge because he was... You know, he never lost a, a knockout game. Uh, well, a knockout tie, I mean, I should say. Never lost a domestic uh, knockout game. And, you know, over two legs, he wasn't beaten in Europe. He, you know, lost a final penalties after drawing over 120 minutes. But, in you know, in the league, uh, I'm not sure the way he set the side up kind of translated to that. I think it was a lot more set up to, uh, to be beneficial towards uh, ties where there's a lot more parity in quality between the teams compared to, you know, the Scottish Premiership where whenever Rangers play, usually, you know, you're coming up against two banks of five or, uh, you know, four four two low block kind of deal. So it's 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 kind of different, um, different profiles of manager required for different jobs, I think. And I'm not sure he fulfilled the, the second yeah, and as we kind of mentioned, and you mentioned there yourself, it's been a very good start for Michael Beale. I think it's 12 wins from 13, and the only mm. drop points came against Celtic, including progress in both cup competitions. You've got a League Cup final at the end of the month. Mm. Are there signs that he's starting to get his ideas across? Maybe. Obviously, we had that really great performance against Hearts the other week. Where it really should have been, it should have been more, but we did well. And then there'll be other games where it feels like a lot of the players just haven't played with each other before. You know, there's still a lot of fluency needing to be gained. Uh, a lot of players are still coming back from injury. A lot of players uh, are still coming into the team for the first time. And as well, our two new signings from the uh, winter window also trying to be bedded in. So there's a lot more that could be done to make the team better, but. You know, football's a results business and he's getting them so far anyway. Yeah, you kind of mentioned maybe a lack of continuity. The goalkeeper situation is one I've mm. noticed. He's been chopping and changing the goalkeeper. But is it, do you look at it as a positive that he's still getting these results despite maybe not playing consistently brilliant, essentially? Yeah, it's always hard to come in right in the middle of a season, especially when the team has had been suffering a few few really poor results and trying to have to write a ship rather than keep it going, you know. So he's he's come in and he's he's obviously stamped his authority down and he's we're you know, results is the main thing. When he has a full preseason, you know, it'll obviously be a whole different conversation. But for now, you know, you I can't complain too much really. And do you think there's similarities with the way that Beale's trying to set the team up to play as when he was there with Gerard? Any sort of similar patterns you're seeing at all? Yeah, the way he sets the, the midfield up, what would happen under Gerard is that, you know, it'd be a 4 3 3, and your, your two number 10s basically would come inside. And your midfield trio at the time, it was it, it would have been Aribo, Kamara, and whoever was at six, maybe Stephen Davis or whatever. And they'd shift from side to side depending on uh, which way the opponent wanted to play down in order to stifle pressure and create um, you know, groups of players to win the ball back heavily. Now he's kind of doing that, but there's more of an onus on freedom amongst the front three or four players. Uh, Malik Tillman, who's usually seen as coming in on the right-hand side for midfield three is allowed to drift. Same with uh, Kent and Cantwell or uh, Sakala, whoever's playing out wide there, allowed to rotate. When when Gerard was in the first time, uh, the front three qu rotated quite a lot when Morelos played. Uh, and obviously it depends if it's Morelos or Cholak or Roof, but there's, there's a lot more kind of um, shifting about positionally. 
which is, I suppose, you know, he's changed depending on the changes of personnel. It's not all the same players he had back when he was last in, so it's more adapted, I suppose. Yeah, that's you kind of mentioned that a bit more fluid in terms of movement, and that's something I would probably criticise Van Bronckhorst's team for, was that mm. they were almost too, so rigid and predictable in how they were going to play. It would yeah. go from one side of the park to the other side, and they would almost just play in front of you. Mm. And... I think that's maybe what I've noticed watching a few of the Rangers games is there's a bit more freedom. In particular, Ryan Kent seems to have mm. picked up a bit of form in recent weeks. Yeah, Ryan Kent's really done well. He's he's been he's had a lot of he's always had responsibility kind of placed on him, but now he's kind of been given a role where he can take on responsibility in other areas of a park besides that kind of left uh, left wing spot, and it's really it's really allowed him to change. It's a bit like, uh, you know, when when Morelos first came in a few years ago and he was allowed to basically pick each kind of defender he wanted to go up against and attack and can, can you know, he can shift over to right, he can come through the middle and luckily the other players are able to fill in in these other positions and take uh, fill in gaps and uh, really allow him to make make space for himself and make, you know, make things happen. Yeah, and a couple of players who certainly from the games I've seen that have started to impress since Beal's come in. Malik Tillman's been one who seems to have got a bit of Lisa life. Maybe he's just got mm. used to the league, but I also think Fashion Sakala has been quite impressive in a lot of the games. What have you made of their form since Beal's arrived? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, Tillman especially, he's he's caught the eye and of course he has because in, in, in a league like ours, Players who are really, really solid technical players will always stand out compared to, you know, a lot of teams who just have good athletes. I think Tillman, he's, his vision's good, his short range of passing is good, and he's, he's underrated in the physical side of the game. He's one of the best ball winners uh, in terms of under-21 players in Europe, I think was a, a stat that I've seen on Twitter this week. And Fashion Sakali, he's a totally different profile. He's... He's, you know, more of an athlete than Tillman, but he's also a lot more of a goal scorer than, say, Scott Wright, for example. So it, it helps, you know, against certain teams where, you know, you want someone who's going to make that run behind and is always going to be trying to run and always going to be trying everything and he, who wants to take the shot rather than find the pass. So it, it, it's good for, it's good to have a different kind of set of options for each of them. And they both come on well because I think... You know, Sakala was signed by Gerard and Beal. So uh, he knows how to use Sakala better. I think Van Broncos only saw him as an out and out winger rather than maybe that as an inside forward. Yeah. Which he's probably more suited to be. And then Tillman, I think he just, uh, he, he, he's probably just gotten better because the team's gotten better and it's really allowed him to, to show what he's all about, basically. You were, you were saying about some of Tillman's stats. His awareness on the pitch can be questioned after the game at the weekend in the cup tie, can't it? Uh, well, you, yeah, you, you, you would be if you're trying to trying to buy a foul and you've just been stamped on. So why not? Why not? <laughs> I'll allow it. <laughs> what did you make of that whole situation on Sunday? I I didn't know what to make of it. <laughs> Honestly, I was I was the whole time I was just thinking they can't, can they? They can't. Maybe like the, the commentator was saying, oh, I think. I think Michael Beale's, uh, Stephen Craig was saying, I think Michael Beale's uh, going to allow Party Fissel to walk through the scores. Like, Stephen Craig, you must be you must be talking some amount of rubbish. That's not right. And then he did. I was just, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what to say. I think in the end, it was probably, well, we won the game, so we can say it was the right decision. But, uh, you, you know, you may as, it, it's not something that happens often enough for me to have too much of an opinion on anyway. It's not, it's not like a weekly occurrence, is it? So, I don't think the message got to Alan McGregor though, did it? Or is that just Alan McGregor was not having um, it after they could see the goal? That's just him. He just had to make him work for it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the game, the games so far this season, they've been pretty close affairs. Obviously, you edged it on the opening day of the season. You came mm. back from a goal down at half time, and and then you managed to rescue a result late on at mm. Ibrox as well. What have you made so far of the games against Livingston this season? I mean, they they have both been rescue jobs and hard for me to watch, to be honest. That's just the nature of any game when you play Livingston, you know, especially if you hand Livingston a lead, which 
we did in both times. It required, you know, an excellent Tavernier free kick in the, the in the opener against you in the first game for the two one, and then it required just a one cross of however many trillion we had to actually find that you know find a body in the end in the second one. So it, it it's it's not been easy, and it's it's always tough playing against a side that understands the the defensive and positional aspects of the game as well as David Martin and Dale's Livingston. So it's, you know, it's a uh, hard to hard to draw too much promise from those two results for this next game. Yeah, you, you mentioned about the number of crosses in the game at Ibrox in particular. I think it was probably the one time Rangers got in behind us in the game and they scored. Mm. And we were kind of saying that whilst sitting in the in the way section just kind of going they've just kind of they've played into our hands essentially no. crosses from deep you know we're going to we're going to take that all day long whilst as I say the one time you guys got in behind us you, you scored I, I mean it was it's you know heading out crosses is your boys meat and potatoes or at least it was that game it definitely felt like it was you know the definition of insanity trying to do the same thing all over again and again to see what than to try and get a different result. So uh, uh, I'm hoping new manager, new change attacked this weekend. Are there any players that you're a bit wary of from the Livingston side going into the game on Saturday? Always, always. I mean, in transitional moments, you guys are you guys are so good in uh, in counter attacking because you, you, your forward players. Not only are they are they great runners, but they also always kind of show good movement in relation to each other. I'm a big fan of uh, Anderson, Bruce Anderson. I think he's I I liked the look of him last season as well, and I think he, obviously Joe Nuble. He's you know he scored against us first game of the season. Yeah, it's 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 always going to be it's always going to be tough, especially when we play with such high such high fullbacks usually in possession but you know are it's going to be crucial that our center midfielders are able to cover a lot of ground against you guys because your forward players are just you know and any team in in transition will, will suffer against you guys and is that an area that you think Levy might be able to exploit Rangers as in terms of the fullbacks being pushed quite high forward mm. up the park mm. I I think so because especially a lot we 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 have suffered a lot from counter attacks this season. I think uh, you know we can, we can tend to leave Goldson and Davies so exposed at times because you know the way Rangers play and the same way as Celtic play, you you're asking to your two centre backs to cover basically half the pitch yeah. of space on the on their lonesome. So it, it it means having to be alert, which we've been guilty of not doing a lot. And it means that, especially your number sixes, which I think Lundstrom's uh, going to be out for the weekend, so it'll probably be maybe Raskin or Kamara or Ryan Jack. Uh, it means they're going to have to really be on their game in order to, to try and cut out these moments that we have been really vulnerable from. And if I had to ask you for a prediction, Alex... What are you going for on Saturday? Uh, I'll, I'll I'll say two 0 to the Rangers. Unfortunately for you guys, I can't knock. Can I? <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything else to be honest from you. I would fully expect you to back your team. But Alex, as we mentioned at the start, you're part of the This Is Ibrox podcast. For any of our listeners that might want to tune in to your your previews or your reviews of the game, where can they find you? Uh, you can find us on Twitter, this is Ibrox. We've got a website where we're posting uh, articles all the time, Facebook as well, all this is Ibrox everywhere, basically. Well, I fully encourage everyone to listen. You guys are very balanced in your in your views on the team as well, which is always quite refreshing for, for fan media as well. <laughs> but uh, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I mean, this in the nicest possible way. I say it most weeks. I hope you have a terrible Saturday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much again for coming on the podcast. Cheers, mate. Much appreciated. Thanks very much. That's it for this week's episode of Thought Livy. Thanks again to every single one of you for tuning in week in and week out. If you can, we'd love to hear your feedback, so either leave us a review on iTunes or simply message us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. 
As Angus said, we are on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Search Total Away to find us. And you'll find all the links to our weekly episodes on there as well. You can also find all our episodes, including this one, on all good podcast streaming sites, including iTunes and Spotify. We're also on YouTube, so don't forget to subscribe to the channel. None of those options suit you, though. All you have to do is head to our website, totallivypodcast.libson.com, where you'll find every single episode that we have done over the last few years. That's it for this week. Thanks again to all our listeners for tuning in. Let's hope for another great week following the Lovian's finest football team. Livingston, oh Livingston, into the premature.